and we'll start the dream of the rude. I've got uh, a page up, which I'll talk about in a moment. I'm going to, I'm going to scroll through some of these images um, because it's kind of cool, actually, about the dream of the rude. Um, the manuscript that it's preserved in, the Vercelli manuscript, okay, which is in Italy, uh, and I made a comment the other day, somebody on YouTube kind of a pest, uh, corrected me on a couple of things. Um, when I made the comment about um, the Junius manuscript, I've not been able to watch the uh, video because it won't load for me for some reason, but apparently I uh, had a slip of the tongue and I said the Junius manuscript was in the Bodleian Library in London. The Bodleian Library is in Oxford, okay? Um, the Noel Codex, which is the Beowulf manuscript, is in the British Library, which is in London. The Vercelli manuscript is in the cathedral. It's not called Vercelli, I don't believe, but it's in a cathedral in um, Italy, and the Exeter manuscript is in Exeter Cathedral in Exeter, where it has been since about 1015 AD. It's the one manuscript we can actually say, for as long as it has been in, in existence, we know where it's been. Junius manuscript, we can't say that. Beowulf manuscript, we definitely can't say that. And Vercelli manuscript, we have no idea, really, <laughs> how this thing got from Anglo-Saxon England to, um, well, we have some ideas, but we're not sure, necessarily, um, how it got to Italy, right? But the manuscript, as all four of those manuscripts, dates to right around 1000 AD, plus or minus 25 years, okay? So they all date to somewhere between 975, 1025, right? We can date them on the basis of the handwriting, letter forms, for example, okay? Interesting thing about the Dream of the Rude, though, is unlike most other Anglo-Saxon poetry, at least part of it survives in another context, okay? In another location. This cross, this stone cross in a, now, in a small church in southwestern Scotland. I'm going to kill the lights for a moment, so you might be able to see that from up here. In Dumfries, um, Scotland, it's in the church called Dumfries Church, okay, stands about 18 feet tall now. We don't know how tall it originally stood. Because in the Protestant Reformation, the cross was broken. And there was an, a, uh, a movement to destroy pretty much all Christian art because it was thought to be idolatrous. You, know, um, there sh you shall have no graven images, even crosses. Okay, So crosses, icons of... Mary, icons of Christ, etc. We'll talk about this a little bit more when we get up to Shakespeare's day. So they included these standing crosses that there were quite a few of in Anglo-Saxon England. Right? The crosses were destroyed, broken, knocked over, used for building material. Right? This one was possibly, right? was possibly broken out of a um, benign motive okay, to hide it from the Puritans. Okay? It was broken, it was hidden in the floor, in the ground, that is, of the church itself. Okay? We do know in later times, in the 19th century, it was outside the church, standing upright. The cross piece that you see right here, this is not original. This is a 19th century reconstruction. Okay? Um, I'll scroll down in a moment. There's only a little slab that remains of the original cross piece. Okay? Now here's what's so interesting about this cross. You have one image in your um, introduction, and Luisa talks a little bit about it, but you can see you know, it's carved. 
Okay, it's carved on all four sides. This is the remaining piece of the cross beam. Okay, carved on all four sides. So you got Jesus and Mary Magdalene, and you got the Annunciation down here, and you got some apostles and things like that. Okay, you also have on this side with all the scroll work, and then on the opposite side, a runic inscription that goes up and down. This is an image of the runic inscription a little bit blown up, okay, or zoomed in on. Um, let me go back to over here. And here is where you see part, I don't know if that will help it here in just a moment. Here you see part of the inscription. Okay, I'm not going to uh, read the runes, I'd have to have a cheat sheet in front of it. But what the runes say is part of the dream of the root. Okay? The cross, archaeologists tell us, dates from right around 680 to 700 AD. So pretty early within Christian Anglo-Saxon England. Remember, um, Augustine brought Roman Christianity in 597. So if it's 680, it's less than 100 years after that, okay? It's got this part of the poem. Now, the poem survives, as I said, in this manuscript that dates a few hundred years later. If the poem dates from the time of the cross, then that means this relatively long Christian poem is very, very early in terms of Anglo-Saxon literature. When did we say Bede possibly lived or died? Okay. Not, sorry, not Bede, Cadman. Cadman recounts the story of Bede in the same year that Abbas Hild dies, 681. So Cadman was flourishing, we could say, sometime right around 680. Remember what I said was the, the real significant thing about Cadman? It wasn't that he was an illiterate shepherd. It wasn't that he was an illiterate shepherd. It's that he used that native Germanic tradition for creating poetry, the whole alliterative um, technique, okay, for Christian purposes, sometime right around 680. But if this also dates from sometime right around 680, okay, then that is showing that adaptation, if you want, of that native Germanic tradition really taking off fast. Because somebody else, not Cadman, creates what is sometimes called the most beautiful Christian poem of Anglo-Saxon England, if not of all of England in the same time that Cadman creates Cadman's hymn, right? So, let's look at the poem itself. The dream of the rood. Rood is an old English word for cross, okay? So, if you had, if you were to go into a typically designed Anglo-Saxon church, as I drew the other day, it would look like a cross from the top. It would be cruciform. Okay? So you'd have the two transepts over here, and the altar would be over here, and then there would be essentially like a wall across there. But it's not a wall. Okay? It's not a solid actual wall. There would be an opening here, and there would usually be an opening here and here. Okay? These openings are for people to come in and out of. This opening is for the priest to go through. So deacons would come in and out of this, these two side doors. And the priest would go in and out of this main area, which is called royal doors. Okay? This Barrier, if you want to call it that, is called in English, or referring to the Anglo-Saxon tradition, the rude screen. Okay. 
because often there would be a cross on it. <coughs> you would also see on it icons, images of saints or biblical stories or Christ. Okay? These are the things especially that the reformers did not like. Okay? So you don't see many rude screens anymore in Anglo-Saxon churches. That is, if you go to England today, and you go into a Church of England church, you won't see many of these. Right? Because they've been done away with. Because the idea is, hey, everybody has full access to God. The mentality was these, the root screen, is separating the priest and the clergy from everybody else. But one person with a Bible can find God. You know, kind of the reformer's mentality. So that's what a root is. The root is, is a cross. Right? So it begins. And we're, and we're told from the modern title, the title is not in the manuscript. Okay? All of these titles are modern inventions. We have no idea what the original authors would have wanted us to call these things. It's called the dream of the root. Okay? It's not the cross dreaming. It's somebody dreaming about the cross. Okay? And the opening word is whack. It's not the Anglo-Saxon word for listen, which is something like uh, euphrygian, or I have heard. Okay? It's what? Well, what is this in modern English? What's it? It's what? You've got at least three Old English poems that begin this way. Beowulf begins this way. And a Saint's Life poem, Andreas, also begins with what? Problem is, translating-wise, we're not exactly sure how it should be translated. What? Okay. Listen. Um... Seamus Haney, if I remember correctly, opens Beowulf with so, you know, which I always say, so what? <laughs> what do you mean, so? Uh, older translators translated this as low. Okay. What we think it is, or, or the purpose that we think it serves, is kind of like somebody standing up at a dinner party with a glass of crystal and a fork and going... Okay? You're getting everybody's attention. I've actually seen a, a version of Beowulf online translated, Yo! <laughs> what are you doing? You're quieting down all those drunken things. You're getting them to listen to the main attraction. Okay? What? Low. So, just doesn't work for me. I, there's something about that just doesn't work. Okay? So, listen! In other words, your attention please, but your attention please doesn't really work with the meter. So it's got to be one syllable. Listen, I will speak of the sweetest dream what came to me in the middle of the night when speech bearers slept in their rest. Okay, here's where I'm going to start picking on Lewis and his translation. Speech bearers. Uh, make sure I get the spelling right. Okay. The Old English is railroad bearing, which is literally speech bearing. So he changes speech bearing into speech bearers. What are speech bearers? Are these the people who walk around with Obama's teleprompters? <laughs> speech bearers? No. So what are they? No. Nope. Not scribes, not storytellers, not poets or shops. Us. People. Humans. Why? We're the only ones who speak. Okay. Isn't the purpose of translation to take something from one language and to make it intelligible? 
in your language, your current language, how intelligible was this? It wasn't. Right? So why did he leave it this way? I have no idea why he left that. Okay. What came to me in the middle of the night when you want to be not sexist? Humanity. I'll be my traditional sexist self. When men slept in their breast. It seemed that I saw a most wondrous tree raised on high, wound round with light, the brightest of beams. All that beacon was covered in gold. Okay? Beacon. What's a beacon? Like a ray? If you're out on the ocean at night and you're coming in too short, what do you hopefully see, especially if you have rocky cliffs? A lighthouse? Okay, that's what it is. All that beacon was covered in gold. Jim stood fair at the cor earth's corners, and there were five up on the crossbeam. Okay, so... Jim stood fair at the earth's corners. Where are the corners of the earth? North, south, east, west. Okay. So why are there gems standing at the four corners of the earth? What does he mean, he, the speaker, because it is male, by gems? What physical state, what physical position is the dreamer in? Sleeping. He's lying down. Okay? He's not, you know, asleep standing up. Okay? He sees a dream. He looks up. He sees a dream. What does he see? He sees the cross. Okay? How big is the cross? Why do you say pretty big? Okay, it's raised on high. It's elevated up above him. Yeah, I think it's probably because the cross is reaching from horizon to horizon, horizon to horizon. What are the gems? No. Louder. Okay, the edge, the, the end. Keep going. Keep going. Close. What happened with the nails in the body? Blood. Okay. The gems are the blood. So you got the blood on this end of the cross piece, this end of the cross piece, the foot end of the cross piece. Why the head end? Crown of thorns. Okay. So he sees gems, blood, on the four corners. Okay. But we were just told all that beacon was covered in gold. Hmm. Gems stood fair at the four corners, and there were five on the cross beam. Five gems somewhere across the cross beam itself. All the angels of the Lord looked on. The old English shares, they held in their angel drikafena. Many, or all, if you want, of the angels of the Lord saw that. Fair through all eternity. That was no felon's gallows. That was no criminal's cross. But Holy Spirit beheld them there, men over the earth and all this glorious creation. He's listing what beheld Christ on the cross. Holy spirits, angels, could also refer to saints, okay? Men, all the people who witnessed the crucifixion, and what else? All this glorious creation. Wondrous was the victory tree, and I was stained by sins. Okay? Notice how the tree is now called. It's... The old English is Sia Beam. Sia is victory. Beam, beam, tree, wood. Okay. 
Wondrous was the victory tree, and I was stained by sins. Notice the juxtaposition. The cross is wondrous to behold, and yet the speaker says, stained by sins. What does that mean? He's got a little stain. Covered. And I was covered by sins. Wounded with guilt. Interesting choice of terms. Wounded. I saw the tree of glory honored in garments. Shining with joys, bedecked with gold. Why? Because in Anglo-Saxon England, it would be difficult. If you had a cross in a church, not this kind of cross, because that would be hugely expensive. If you had a cross in church, that cross would, for the services of the church, be either wood plated with gold or would be gold itself with gems in it. Okay? So, he sees the cross like he would see a cross in a church covered with gold in gemstones. Gems had worthily covered, or had covered worthily, the Creator's tree. And yet beneath that gold, I began to see an ancient, wretched struggle. What does he mean, beneath the gold? He's suddenly Superman, and he can, has x-ray vision? When it first began to bleed on the right side, the tree starts to bleed. On the right side. Not the viewer's right side. The tree's right side. Why? Yep. The spear in the side. Okay. I was all beset with sorrows, fearful for that fair vision. I saw that eager beacon change garments and colors. So, he first sees it decked out in gold and gems. And in it kind of like changes. It's no longer covered in gold and gems, but now it's drenched, stained with blood. Now bedecked with treasure. Gold and gems covered with blood. Gold and gems covered with blood. What's the poet suggesting? Bingo. He's actually seeing the same thing. It's just he's seeing more deeply. He's perceiving what the gems and the gold kind of symbolize. Okay? The blood of Christ. And yet, lying there a long while, I beheld in sorrow the Savior's tree. Until I heard it utter a sound, that best of woods began to speak words. This is an example of what's called prosopopoeia. Right? Prosopopoeia is when an inanimate object speaks. We've got a lot of examples in medieval literature. Medieval Germanic literature, they love to do this. Have swords suddenly be able to take on the powers of speech right? or pieces of wood. There's an um, old English poem called The Husband's Message. It's about runes inscribed on a piece of wood, and it's not that the wood itself is speaking the message. Right? So here are the words that the cross speaks to the dreamer. It was so long ago I remember it still, that I was felled from the forest's edge, ripped up from my roots. All right. It was so long ago. The Old English is actually not quite as developed as that. The Old English says, that was the R.A.L. That was a long time. It was long ago. It's pretty much it. Okay. I remember it well. That I was felled from the forest edge, ripped up from my roots. Strong enemy seized me there. Who are the enemies? 
Who made the tree into a cross? The Romans. Okay. Strong enemy sees me there, made me their spectacle, made me bear their criminals. They bore me on their shoulders and set me on a hill. Enemies enough fixed me fast. The cross is saying the Romans are its enemies. There's at least one really good reason why. What they do to the cross. Or let me put, rephrase that. What did they do to the tree that became the cross? They killed it. That pretty much would make one an enemy, right? Okay. They killed it. They set me on a hill. Enemies enough fixed me fast. The implication is kind of, you know, and it took a lot of them to do it, too. <laughs> then I saw the Lord of mankind hasten eagerly when he wanted to ascend upon me. Okay? The word that gets translated Lord is Freya. It's a word that also means friend. Then I saw the friend of mankind. That he what? He hastened eagerly when he wanted to ascend upon him. You don't have the late medieval suffering Jesus. The namby-pamby kind of, oh, life's really bad and I've got to hang on this cross and I don't really. What kind of Jesus is this? Action Jesus. This is action hero of Jesus. You know, fully moldable. And, you know, what's he want to do? He wants to get on that cross. When? Yesterday. He is hastening eagerly to do what? To ascend. Notice, this isn't Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ where he's being nailed. This is Jesus jumping up on that cross. Okay? I did not dare to break or bow down against the Lord's word when I saw the ends of the earth tremble. What does he mean? Against the Lord's word. I did not dare to break or bow down against the Lord's word. Remember that fourfold Germanic ethic I put up here the other day? What's the first component? Duty to your Lord. Okay. Who's the tree's Lord? God. <laughs> Jesus, creator. Okay. So what's the Lord's word? you got to be a cross for me, buddy. I know you don't want to do it, but no, I've singled you out. Okay. I did not dare to break. That is, the cross is suggesting, if I wanted to, I could have broken. I could have broken in two. Okay. Or I could have bowed down. But, Germanic ethic, I can't go against the Lord's word. When I saw the ends of the earth tremble. What's he talking about, the ends of the earth trembling? There is an earthquake. Okay. Easily I might have felled all those enemies. One of the most enigmatic lines to me, yet fast I stood. How? How could the cross have felled all those enemies? Well, if they're one by one nailed up on it, that's one way. How else? Is this like, yeah, cross jujitsu? You know, it's going <laughs> to... Start going out after them. Then the young hero made ready. That was God Almighty. Okay. Notice what the poet has just done. Young hero implies what? Strong and mighty. Okay. What else? What's this emphasizing about Christ? Other than that he's young and heroic. Get it something much, much, much more basic than that. He's what? He's a what? He's a man. Okay? He's a man. Okay? So, then the young hero made ready. 
that was God Almighty. What's that telling us about him? <laughs> he's, he's this, but he's also this. Okay, the God man. So what's the poet doing? He's kind of going down his doctrinal checklist, and he's making sure. Okay, got the doctrine straight. He's not all man and partly God, and he's not all God, kind of pretending to be man. He's man, man, and God, God. <coughs> the young hero made ready, that was God Almighty, strong and resolute. Okay. Strong kind of implies, I think, physical strength. Resolute <laughs> implies what? This. This. Okay. Come what come, come what may, he's ready. He ascended on the high gallows. Notice, he's not nailed to it. He's not passive. This is an active, okay, young hero. Brave in the sight of many when he wanted to ransom mankind. Now, an Anglo-Saxon audience would have understood ran ransoming because it began in the Anglo-Saxon period. I don't mean Greeks and Romans didn't ransom their friends who were captured in battle, but I mean from an English standpoint, it begins in the Anglo-Saxon period. Somebody gets captured, and what do you do? You buy them off. You pay the capturer a certain amount of money, and the person gets released. But what's he buying off? Humanity. Okay. Brave inside of many when he wanted to ransom mankind. I trembled when he embraced me. Again, you can't embrace like this, right? You don't go up to somebody and say, nice to see you. It doesn't work. You have to reach around, put them in your arms. That's the description of Christ on the cross. Like he's giving this tree a big old bear hug. When he embraced me, but I dared not bow, uh, bow to the ground or fall to the earth's corners, I had to stand fast. What is the cross telling us it wanted to do? It wanted, yeah, it wanted to be anything but the source of execution for Christ. I was reared as a cross. And that, that verb, rear, okay, even the Old English, notice, it has two meanings. What's one of them? Exactly. Child rearing. What does that mean? Training, teaching, instilling virtues, etc. What else does it mean? Raising up, lifting up. The cross was reared up, like when a horse rears up. Okay? I was reared as a cross. The cross is telling us, this was my raison d'etre. This was my reason for being. It's like I grew from this little acorn just so the Romans could come cut me down and I could be used to kill God. They drove, excuse me, I was raised, I raised up the mighty king, the Lord of heaven. Mighty king, Lord of heaven. I dared not lie down. They drove dark nails through me. Well, we can maybe quibble with the uh, language there a little bit. I probably would. What does it mean, through me? It goes all the way through? Okay. Who, what actually had nails driven through? Christ. Into the, actually, into the wrist, comes through into the tree, into the cross. It doesn't necessarily poke out the back of the cross. 
but maybe the Christ is telling us something we never knew about, you know, crucifixions. They drove dark nails through me. The car's scars are still visible. The cross is saying, look, look, open wounds of hate, hate. I dared not harm any of them. What's the cross, again, telling us? By saying, I dare not. I really wanted to, but I couldn't. They mocked us both together. What's the cross saying? Who's the cross identifying with? All mankind. Christ. They mocked us. Who's the us? Christ and the cross. Okay? They mocked us together. I was all drenched with blood. Yeah, so was Christ. <laughs> Where's the blood coming from? Not from the tree. This isn't sap that's being talked about. It's the blood of Christ on it. Question? I thought I heard something. Okay. I was all drenched with blood flowing from that man's Side. Okay. After he had sent forth his spirit. Notice. Father, receive my spirit into your hands. I commit my uh, into your hands. I commit my spirit. It is finished. And he dies. Much have I endured on that hill of hostile fates. I saw the that man. Here's the other side. God of Hosts cruelly stretched out. Darkness had covered with its clouds the ruler's corpse. Corpse? Rulers. That shining radiance. Really? Have you seen any dead bodies? They don't shine very much. Shadows spread gray under the clouds. All creation wept. Mourn the king's fall. Now, Leusa translates king. Uh, excuse me, capitalizes king. The Old English manuscript doesn't. Christ. Christ was on Rodi, the Old English says. Christ was on the cross. This is the thematic center of the poem. Even though, by line numbering, it's not even close to the center of the poem. So what's happening? All creation, we're told, weeps. Why? Because God died. Right? And yet, from afar, men came hastening to that noble one. I believe the old English there is Adelaide. Um, what is that? Uh, 57 or so. Yep, to that Adelaide. It means prince. I mean, that's how it's usually translated Adelaide, prince, right? Um, men came from afar, hastening to that noble one. I watched it all. That is, the cross is still awake. I was all beset with sorrow, yet I sank into their hands, humbly, eagerly. Eagerly, this is, you know, the cross being taken out of the hole. Do you know how a cross is raised? Because right? a cross isn't, you know, just seven or eight feet tall with a, a uh, beam across the sides, you know, six or seven feet long, wide enough for a man's span. A cross is probably 12 to 14 feet. Right? It's made out of like six by six or eight by eight beams. Big, heavy wood. So you can't just lift it easy, easily. So what you have to do is you dig a hole about three feet, maybe four feet deep, okay? And you put the foot of the cross at the top of the hole. You nail the person who's going to be crucified on the cross, okay? while it's lying flat. And then you put the foot of the cross here and you get several men to lift up so that when it gets high enough like this, what does the cross do? Oh. 
falls and I fall. Wham! What happens when it falls and it hits ground? Yeah, ouch. That's very pretty. Okay? What immediately happens to both shoulders? They dislocate. Okay? So now you're hanging. Your hands might be tied, but probably not. You're being, you're hanging by these big old nails driven right here because your hand's not going to rip off because this is pretty strong tendon and ligaments. So you're like this. The cross falls. Boom. Both shoulders dislocate. So now you can't take deep breaths. And all you're doing is going... That's why um, the chief priest go to Pilate and request for Christ's legs to be broken, or request for the three men's legs to be broken. Why? It's the Passover. They don't want them hanging on the crosses over the Passover. Not a good idea. Okay? Break their legs for what purpose? Well, it could be so that they can't support themselves on a possible plank that they're resting on. But, you know, legs are like this, nail through the ankles. So when that thing falls, what does that nail do? It rips up through the flesh. Okay? The breaking of the bones is for pain, pure and simple. The shock of the pain will be enough to kill. Okay? So, the cross says, they did what? They laid me down. That is, they have to pull the cross out of the hole and lay it down. There they took, it's a noble one, almighty God. Why does the poet keep doing this? I wasn't kidding when I said before, he's making sure he's, he's being doctrinally correct. Okay? You got to go forward in time from the crucifixion to 325 AD. And you have what's called the Council of Nicaea. Okay? I'm going to interrupt this flow for just a moment. You have what's called the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea is called by the Emperor Constantine. Constantine was British. Okay. Grew up in Britain, raised by his mother, Helena, okay. and becomes the emperor of the Eastern Empire. Kind of closes up shop in Rome. Change, changes the name of Byzantium to... Yeah, my city, Constantinople. It means Constantine's opal, his city. Okay. And in 325, Constantine calls a great council of the church. Okay. Why? Let me back up a little bit. The other day I mentioned, I think it was this class, I mentioned 312 AD when Constantine makes Christianity the official religion, a little off there. 312 AD is when Constantine saw, had a vision. He's getting ready for a big battle against the Roman Empire, okay? and called the Novian Bridge. And he has, he has this vision. And in the vision, what he sees is a cross in the sky. And he hears a voice that says, in hoc signo... Uh, Wiki or something like that. In this sign, be victorious. Okay? Constantine is not a Christian himself when that happens. In three, he does win, by the way, and becomes emperor of kind of uh, the whole Roman Empire. Then in 315, he passes legislation that makes Christianity the official religion of Rome. So within a period of less than 20 years, Christianity goes from being outlawed and being persecuted 
to being the official religion. Okay? 325, Constantine calls for this great council. Why? What, what is so important that a council needs to be called? Well, there's an Egyptian <laughs> priest by the name of Arius. And he has started teaching in Egypt, and he has a pretty good following. He has started teaching that Jesus, the Christ, is not God. He is not God as God is God. Okay? So what does he mean by that? He says that there was a point in time when the Son was not. There was a point in time when the Son was not. In other words, there was a point in time when there was only God the Father. Okay? And this idea starts to spread. It starts to spread so that there are followers of Arius who are disagreeing with the rest of the church. By the rest of the church, I mean like the other 98%. So, bishops are complaining, chattering, and the emperor, Constantine, says, all right, we're going to have a, a council. He calls all the bishops, and they meet in a little town called Nicaea, which is outside Constantinople. And the main reason is to determine the truth or falsehood of Arius' teaching. Okay? Let me rephrase that. The main reason is to get Arius to admit he's wrong. Because all the other bishops don't agree with him. Now, when I say all the other bishops, I don't mean, you know, Arius doesn't have any bishops in support. He does have bishops who support him. Okay? But they're the minority. Okay? The purpose of the council is to affirm what the other bishops say has been the teaching and tradition of the church from the beginning. What do I mean from the beginning? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Christ says that. Okay? So, they have this council. And the council takes place, takes several months, and what comes out of the council is what is called the Nicene Creed, okay? It's actually, in 325, it's only part of what is today known as the Nicene Creed, okay? It's the first part. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, begotten of the Father, very God of very God, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made. So you get all that in there? Begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father, very God of very God. That is, God, God, not God, light, right? Not God, point one. Same thing, right? And the council affirms this. It comes with that, that statement that I just recited. Okay. It doesn't go on much from there. I mean, it does say some things about Mary. Okay. Uh, it doesn't really touch on the Holy Spirit. That comes later in another council, which gets added in a little bit later. Um, but they're doing this for a reason. Because Arius' ideas, as I said, have spread. Well, where have they spread to? One big follower of Arius are the Goths. Okay? The Goths. And there are Goths okay, made their way to England so that we know Arius' ideas were around in late Roman England. Okay? Late Roman before 410. 
And we're pretty sure that by 700, there were still what are called Aryan Christians okay, in England as well as other parts of the country or other parts of Europe. Right. So why is the poet doing this? Because the poet is affirming exactly fully man, fully God. Because one of the other things the Council of Nicaea did is it said Jesus, the person called the Christ, was fully man. He was entirely human. That is, he wasn't one of the early heresies of the church, the, the docetist her heresy. He wasn't an appearance of a man. So that when he hung on the cross, he didn't, you know, it, it really was painful. The docetist said, no, nah, it wasn't really. He just kind of made made us think it was really painful because God can't suffer. Why? Because God is eternal. God is unchangeable. To suffer means to be able to change. Okay? So what the Nicene, uh, what the Council of Nicaea did, said, was he was fully this. Why? Because of Mary. And he was fully this. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit, so to speak. Right? So the poet is emphasizing this kind of doctrinal purity, this doctrinal truth. Go back to the poem. They laid him down. Bo uh, let me back up. There they took Almighty God, lifted him from his heavy torment. The warriors then left me standing drenched in blood. In other words, they didn't think about me. They didn't care for me at all. I was just a tree. I was just the instrument for torture. They left me all standing drenched in blood, all shot through with arrows. I don't think he means that literally. Right? They laid him down, bone weary. Okay? That's an example of what is called lycotes. Lycotes is severe understatement. Understatement. How bone weary was Jesus? Dead. <laughs> Dead. That's pretty bone weary, okay? And stood by his body's head. Notice his body's head. The speaker doesn't say they stood by his head. Why not? Why say his body's? The corpse's head. Where is the he. Okay. C.S. Lewis once said, you are not a body. You are a soul inhabiting a body. Okay. So, they stood by his body's head. They watched. So you can almost put that over here. His body's head. They watched over the Lord of heaven, who rested a while. Really? This isn't Dan Brown, you know. He's mostly dead. All he needs is Miracle Max to come and give him a pill. He rested a while from his weary battle. They began to build a tomb for him in the side of his slayer. That's the cross. All right. They carved it from bright stone, set within the Lord of victories. Really? How victorious was he? He's dead. Anglo-Saxon mentality, Germanic mentality, usually a lord of victory, yeah, he's striding away from the battlefield. He's got loads of loot in his arms. They began to build a tomb for him. They carved it from bright stone, set within the lord of victories. Then they began to sing a dirge for him, wretched at evening. When they wished to travel hence, Weary from the glorious Lord. He rested there with little company. More like to tease. How little company did he rest with? Yeah, he's by himself. Okay. So, they put him in the tomb. And then they go away. Who's being talked about, by the way, here? The they. Is it the apostles? Louder? 
No. This is where you got to know your biblical history a little bit. This is Nicodemus and Joseph who come take Christ from the cross because we're the apostles. Man, they ditched him. Okay? Except for John, the disciple. But they ditched him. Okay? So he rests there by himself. And as we stood there, who's the we? Humanity. Humanity. <coughs> Humanity. Nope, who's speaking? The cross. the cross is speaking. We, me, and the other two crosses. As we stood there, weeping a long while fixed in our station, the song ascended from those warriors. This is their funeral dirge. The corpse grew cold. Corpse. He's being pretty clear here. What was a man is now a dead man. Corpse grew cold, the fair life house. Then they began to fell us all to the earth. A terrible fate. They dug for us a deep pit, yet the Lord's thanes, friends, found me there. They... Probably the enemies dug a deep pit, put the cross in it. Yet the Lord's things, friends, found me there and adorned me with gold and silver. What is he talking about? He's talking about, if you get back to Constantine, Constantine's mother, St. Helena, who has a vision in... Early 330s, I believe, might be the 320s, who has a vision where the cross tells her, Come find me. Come seek the cross. Okay? So she goes to the Holy Land and she goes outside Jerusalem. And there are stories about where the cross is buried and such. And they find three crosses. St. Helena does. Okay? Well, they have to determine which one's. Christ's cross, because it's not like Jesus died here, you know, on the cross. Even though the gospel accounts do say Christ's cross had the plaque on the top that said King of the Jews in Greek, Latin, and Aramaic. Apparently doesn't have that anymore. So, Helena finds these three crosses, and the bishop, I can't remember his name, the bishop of Jerusalem prays and says, here's how we'll know what the true cross is. The true cross is the one that heals those with illnesses. So they start bringing sick people. Paraplegics, quadriplegics, all plegics, you know, people with epilepsy, etc. They come in, they fall under the shadow of one of the thieves' cross, it doesn't do any good. The other thieves' cross doesn't do any good. They fall under the shadow of the third cross, and they're instantly healed. Okay? That's what's being referenced there. So, they take that cross and they adorn it with gold and silver. Now notice what the cross does. What's the cross been saying so far? History. That's all in the past. That's all history. Okay. Which, from the Anglo-Saxon perspective, bear in mind, if the poem dates from, say, 680, then you're 650 years after the crucifixion. In other words, it's closer to the crucifixion than we are to Magna Carta. Okay. And it's 350 years after the finding of the cross. In other words, it's closer to the finding of the cross than we are to the Mayflower. So now the cross changes its approach. Now, now, you can hear, my dear hero, who's the cross calling the hero? No, not Christ. The person dreaming, okay, who said at the beginning of the poem, and I stained with sins. Now you can hear, my dear hero, that I've endured the work of evildoers, harsh sorrows. Now the time has come, again, emphasizing present tense. The time has come 
that far and wide they honor me. Who's the they? Next line. Men over the earth in all this glorious creation. That is, it's not just men that honor the cross. The cross is saying, everything made honors me. And pray to this sign, as the cross kind of metaphorically taps its chest. On me, the Son of God suffered for a time. On me, excuse me, and so, glorious now, I rise up under the heavens and am able to heal each of those who is in awe of me. All right? Once, I was made into the worst of torments, most hateful to all people, before I opened the true way of life for speech bearers, humans. Lo, the king of glory, guardian of heaven's kingdom, honored me over all the trees of the forest, just as he is also mighty God, honored his mother Mary herself above all womankind for the sake of all men. Okay? So we've had the king of glory, the guardian of heaven's kingdom. We've had almighty God mentioned. We've had the cross mentioned. And we've had Mary mentioned. Well, you find all of those things persons, if you want, mentioned at two different feasts of the church. The feast of the elevation of the cross and the feast of what's called the exaltation of the cross. This is celebrated every year on September 14th. Unless you're Russian, in which case they move it back like 12 days because they're on a different, they're on the old Gregorian calendar. Okay? This is celebrated. I don't remember when the Catholic Church does it now, but in the Orthodox Church, it's the third Sunday of what's called Great Lent. Okay? But what is said in those services, you have God being praised, you have Christ being praised, you have prayers to the cross itself and to Mary. Again, the speaker of the poem or the writer of the poem is kind of dotting all of his theological I's and crossing all of his theological T's. He's getting the doctrine all correct for a purpose. We've not gotten to the purpose yet. Now I bid you. And the word bid can be translated command or it can be translated charge or it can be translated ask. My beloved hero, that you reveal this vision to men. In other words, this vision isn't for your personal well-being. This vision is what? It's for everybody. It's evangelistic in that sense. Tell them in words. Okay? Because this vision has been in what? Has it been in words? It's a vision seen with the mind's eye or however. Tell them in words, it is the tree of glory on which Almighty God suffered for mankind's many sins and Adam's ancient deeds. How ancient? Go way back to the beginning. That's pretty ancient. Death he tasted there. Now, Leusa capitalizes the, the he. The poem is wonderfully ambiguous. Is the he Christ? on the cross, or is it Adam tasting death because of his ancient evil deeds? In the day you eat of this tree, you shall surely die, God says. Death he tasted there, yet the Lord rose again with his great might to help mankind. Okay. So, it's not just the crucifixion that's important. The resurrection, as St. Paul says, is also important. He did what? He ascended into heaven. He will come again to this middle earth to seek mankind on doomsday. He who? Almighty God. The Lord himself and his angels with him. And he will judge. He has the power of judgment. Each one of them as they have earned beforehand here in this lone life. There's that phrase again. Lana. Lone. Transitory. 
This is the only time Louisa translates that word as loan. Every place else, it's either fleeting or transitory. This loaned life, what does that mean? you got to give it back. It's not yours to keep. No one there, there where? The last judgment. What? No one there may be unafraid at the words which the ruler will speak. He's going to say, he will ask before the multitude where the man might be who for the Lord's name would taste bitter death, as he did earlier on that tree. In other words, the Lord's going to say, who is willing to die for me? Be a murderer. But they will tremble then. And little think what they might even begin to say to Christ. But no one there need be very afraid who has borne in his breast the best of beacons. Meaning, no one need be afraid at the day of judgment if they've done what? Worn a cross around their neck. Okay? The cross was adopted early on in the church as a symbol by which other Christians could be known, just like this was. Okay? The fish. Well, um, the Bible does say that, um, uh, that we should take up the cross to go, but could it be metaphorically um, speaking that, you know, that people should be afraid when they? Yeah, it could mean that. It could easily mean those who have had the mark of the cross, that is, martyrdom. Okay? Christ definitely says, you must take up your cross and follow me. Okay? But no one there uh, need be very afraid who's born in his breast, the best of beacons. Because notice, it's in his breast. That's inside. It's not necessarily just wearing one outside. Okay? But through the cross shall seek the kingdom every soul from this earthly way, whoever thinks to rest with the ruler. So, when he has the vision, the cross tells history, okay, and then it gives the dreamer what? A command. Go, tell everybody. Tell them what? Have trust in the cross. Have faith in the cross. What is the cross? It's a symbol of what? Christianity. It's symbolic of Christ. Okay? Then I prayed to the tree. What are we back to? I, the dreamer, I prayed to the tree with a happy heart. Notice he doesn't say I prayed to Jesus or I prayed to God. He says I prayed to the tree, to the cross itself, with a happy heart. What was his heart like at the beginning of the poem? Okay. He says, and I was stained by sins, wounded with guilt. Okay. Now, I prayed to the tree with a happy heart, eagerly there where I was alone with little company. How little? Me, myself, and I. More life it is. My spirit longed to start on the journey forth. What journey? Louder? Evangelism. Okay. The journey to do what the cross told him to do. Is that it? Or could it be something else also? The journey to heaven? Yeah. Okay. Kind of the exile that we were talking about the other day with the seafarer. It has felt so much of longing. Longing. What is the speaker mean longing desire for what exactly for something more for something that the soul of the speaker has not found here okay something more everybody thinks everybody bill gates thinks there's got to be something more. There's, it can't just be, you know, earn and burn, so to speak. It is now my life's hope that I may seek the tree of victory alone, more often than all men, and honor it well. 
I wish for that with all my heart, and my hope of protection is fixed on the cross. That is, he's hoping that the cross will protect him in his search. I have few wealthy friends on earth. What does he mean? He doesn't mean wealthy friends like we think of wealthy friends. No. What's the gold giver? Lords. That's what he's talking about. I don't have many lords here on earth. Those who distribute treasure. They all have gone forth, fled from worldly joys, and sought the king of glory. His earthly friends, excuse me, his few wealthy friends, he says, have gone forth. They died. They've stopped seeking worldly joys, because what happens to all of them, the wanderer tells us. They are lana. They don't last. And sought instead of the king of glory. They, his few wealthy friends, live now in heaven with the high father. It's like we're suddenly talking about Odin. <laughs> and dwell in glory. In each day I look forward to the time when the cross of the Lord, on which I've looked while here on this earth, will fetch me from this, there it is again, Lana Leaf. This lone life, this transitory, fleeting, impermanent, mutable, changeable life. And bring me where there is great bliss, joy in heaven, where the Lord's host is seated at the feast. Okay. Notice how heaven is described in this, in the wanderer, and the seafarer. Is it the image in popular culture, you know, somebody sitting on a cloud with a little harp going, praise Jesus, yinky. What is it? It's a feast. It's a feast. It's a kager. Okay? It is a heavenly party. Why? Book of Revelation. The book of Revelation describes what's called the wedding feast of the Lamb. doesn't mean the Lamb is served. Though metaphorically the lamb is served, it's eating like you can't imagine, drinking like you can't imagine, revelry like you can't imagine. It's the Christian Valhalla. And some mythologers, studies, studiers of mythology, have argued that it is highly likely Germanic mythology's ultimate source is Christianity. That Odin, Thor, all of them have their ultimate source in Christianity. Okay? After all, Odin does what? He hangs on a tree for nine days. To do what? To get wisdom. Right? So, join heaven where the Lord's host is seated at the feast with what? Ceaseless bliss. Compare that with Lana. Ceaseless. It's unending. Okay? Bliss. And then set me where I may afterwards dwell in glory. Have a share of joy fully with the saints. May the Lord be my friend. He who here on earth once suffered on the hanging tree for human sin. He ransomed us and gave us life, a heavenly home. Hope was renewed with cheer and bliss for those who were burning there. What's he talking about? People in hell. This is a reference to what's called the harrowing of hell. Okay? Where, according to the tradition of the church, Christ, during the time when his body was in the tomb, Christ went to hell, knocked on the gates, and merely touching them, blasted them open. Okay? And when he rose from the dead, he took all those who wanted to leave straight from hell to heaven. Okay? And in the teaching of the church, those gates 
are still wide open. That is, anybody who is in hell wants to be there. They're not locked. They're not bound. They're not manacled. They're not chained. They choose to be there. Okay? So, he did what? He was successful in that journey, mighty and victorious. When he came with a multitude, a great host of souls, into God's kingdom, the one ruler almighty, the angels rejoicing, and all the saints already in heaven, dwelling in glory, when almighty God, their ruler, returned to his rightful home. How does the poem come across? What's it sound like? Is it kind of preachy? It is to me. Okay? And I'm used to preaching. My dad was a preacher at the start of the church in Murphy. I'm used to a lot of preaching. It's poetic, though. So what's its purpose? Okay? Horace famously said, the purpose of literature is to teach and delight. A lot of literature is written to teach. Most of it's boring. A lot of literature is written to delight. It doesn't do any good for you. Okay? What about the dream of the rude? I think the dream of the rude is for proselytizing. That is, evangelism. I think it probably is early, the whole poem. 680s, maybe 700s, early 700s. But I think it's designed to do a couple of things. I think it's designed to correct maybe some false beliefs. And that's why the poet does this. Maybe, maybe some Anglo-Saxons have this idea that this, this Hallen, this warrior God, okay, wasn't really man. Or maybe they have this belief that he's just Superman, like four, okay? But he wasn't really God. And I think the poet's trying to say, no, nah, no, no, you got to have both. And you got to have Mary too, which is why he throws in the line about Mary. That, that middle section where he's doing this, and then he talks about Mary, and he talks about Christ will come back and judge. It's like a condensed version of this, of the Nicene Creed. It's like he's giving a little pressy, a little summary, just as a reminder maybe to keep everybody on the right path. All right? Now we're going to start Beowulf on Thursday. Beowulf doesn't do this at all. Beowulf doesn't preach. Okay? Beowulf, you need to make sure you don't start with any bad preconceptions. Beowulf is not Christian. That is, Beowulf, the character, is not Christian. He is a pagan German. Pagan doesn't mean he slaughters babies or offers human sacrifice. There are people who do offer human sacrifice in the poem. Beowulf's not one of them. But Be Beowulf is what is often called a virtuous pagan. Because the poet, who is a Christian poet, is looking back on a pre-Christian time, and he's kind of saying, you know, we could learn some things from them. We could learn some things about virtue from these pagan non-Christians. Okay? All right, we'll stop there, unless you have questions. I don't want to